Hi, everyone. My name is Pat Krug. I am a marine biologist in Los Angeles, California, and I study sea slugs, uh, which I think are the most beautiful and interesting animals in the ocean. And I'm excited to talk to you today a little bit about the work that I do, and in particular, some discoveries that have been made and shared with me thanks to some uh, tide pool explorers from the Falkland Islands who I've gotten to do some work with long distance. So I'm going to show you some slides, some pictures, and some videos about the sea slugs that um, I'm lucky enough to get to study and try to convince you that they are especially beautiful and interesting um, and weird and wonderful. So I saw my first sea slug when I was 10 years old. It was this species of sea slug. There are thousands of different kinds of sea slugs. Um, this particular species was in my science teacher's classroom. Uh, she had a fish tank and she had this sea slug in it and I didn't know what it was. I just knew that it was beautiful and I was fascinated to know why something without a shell and that couldn't swim um, was so colorful and so obvious. Um, it wasn't trying to hide and it didn't seem to have a way of protecting itself from being eaten. Um, from all the fish swimming around in the tank and hungry fish typically eat anything they can get. Um, and I thought this was really fascinating. And my interest in these little animals stuck with me for life. I never stopped. Um, I'm very single-minded single in my interest. Um, I now know that this species has a science name, which is Chromodorus anae. Um, and it belongs to a group of sea slugs called nudibranchs that are very famous for their bright colors. Um, something that scientists have determined is that most species of sea slugs are super picky eaters. You may know some super picky eaters. Um, people who only like to eat one kind of thing uh, and nothing else. Well, that's sea slugs for you. Each species of sea slug typically only eats one kind of coral or one kind of sponge or one kind of seaweed and nothing else. They usually eat things that are toxic or poisonous, um, but they don't get poisoned. Their bodies can handle the poison in their food. And in fact, they concentrate the poison. So they actually get more poisonous than the poisonous thing that they're eating. Some sea slugs eat jellyfish and they, they don't even get stung. They store the stings inside their own bodies. And so they become more toxic. They become filled with stings. And then if anything tries to eat them, that predator gets a mouthful of bad taste or a mouthful of stings that go off. So slugs have this amazing ability to recycle the weapons of their food and use it for their own protection. And that's why sea slugs are so extraordinarily colorful. They've evolved to be beautiful to our eyes, but really as a warning to make it really easy for fish and octopus and crabs to remember, oh my God, I, I ate that once and it made me so sick. It was disgusting. I'm never gonna eat that again. I'm not even gonna lick it. Those bright colors are a warning. And usually in nature, anything that's super colorful is pretty bad tasting. Um, butterflies, um, sea slugs, uh, poison arrow frogs. There are lots of animals that use bright colors as a warning that says, I'm super gross, I'm even poisonous, don't eat me. And the colors actually help predators remember it helps them to learn, don't mess with that. That thing is super gross and nasty and I don't wanna eat it. One of the things you'll notice though is that all these different pictures of slugs, they, their patterns are really different, right? Like some of them have racing stripes, some of them have orange polka dots, some of them have zigzags, um, they might have stripes. They have all these crazy color patterns and so, a lot of research has been done to try to understand what do fish actually learn about slugs? Like which part of these patterns actually says to a fish, this is bad news, don't eat this. This thing is gonna be super gross and make you throw up. And it turns out you can train fish to tell you what fish like and don't like. 
So there is um, a researcher in Australia and she uses these little trigger fish and she trains them by giving them two cards and each card has a different um, pattern on it. Like it might have a yellow outline or blue polka dots and the fish will look at the two cards and it has to pick one. And whichever one it picks is the one that it doesn't, it's not bothered by as much. And when it makes a choice, it swims to the top and gets a fishy treat. Just like your dog gets a treat when it, you know, does the right trick or is a good boy, you give your dog a treat. Well, you can give a fish a treat and train it to pick the pattern that it doesn't mind. And it turns out if you do this, the one thing fish never, ever, ever pick is yellow outline. They hate yellow outline, which is so interesting. I don't know why they hate this, but yellow and purple borders on the edges of things is a, is a sign to fish that just says, danger, danger, do not eat this. And so by learning that fish never pick yellow outline, you can then look at all these sea slugs. And the one thing that you'll see is so many of them have a yellow or a purple outline around their bodies, right? So you can see on all these different sea slugs, what do they have in common? Right around the edge of their body, they almost always have a yellow outline or a purple outline, sometimes both. And that makes it real easy for a fish to remember, oh, that's my danger sign. I don't go there. Don't eat that thing. I'll throw up. Interesting how nature works, isn't it? Um, some sea slugs even make it extra easy for fish to recognize that they are there and bad tasting. And they do this wavy thing where they ripple the edge of their body so that those bands, those purple or yellow edges really stand out. So they kind of do this um, little shimmy with the edge of their body um, to make it extra easy for a, for a fish to see them and to be, you know, repulsed or to remember, don't mess with that. It's super gross. Um, another thing that slugs are sort of famous for is being slimy and they do make a lot of slime, um, but they use those slime trails. So these are two sea slugs and the one behind is actually following the slime trail of the one in front. And they, they can do this for a long, long time. So these two slugs will just follow each other around and around and around. And sometimes you get chains of like four and five slugs and they're all following each other's slime trails and they make like little trains of slugs all following each other. It's really cute. Um, so slugs have these behaviors that are super interesting. Um, and this is a little video. I study these tiny little slugs. They're like the size of raisins. They don't look like much, but there can be huge numbers of them. So where I work in California, there can be 5,000 of these little slugs in a one meter by one meter square. So in a little patch, you could have 5,000 slugs, which is a ton of food for fish and birds, but nobody eats them. So this is a video of a little, little fish here. Here's a little slug rolled up in a ball and the fish tries to eat it. They really want to eat the slugs, but <clears throat> nope, nope, gross, gross, gross. They just spit them out and leave. Um, and this is, a, this is a worm trying to eat a slug. So here's this little slug, doesn't look like much, and this worm really wants to eat it. And it's, oh, it's gonna try to swallow it whole. Oh, it really wants to swallow it, like a, just like a shark, just, oh, but it can't. It's too disgusting. And the worm is gonna try and try and try, but then it just has to give up and go on its little wormy way because the slugs, make chemicals that are just too bad tasting and nothing can manage to eat them because they're just gross. And so you can get thousands and thousands of these little slugs and nobody eats them because they just taste too bad. 
Um, sometimes my students that I teach have to experience this for themselves. So this is a student of mine actually licking a large sea slug because she just wanted to test it herself and see if they really were that gross. Don't do this. Don't lick things in the ocean. It's just, it's unnecessary. Just trust me. I'm a professional. They're gross. Um, okay, I've done it. I've licked some sea slugs. And they are. They're bad tasting. They're gross. It's why fish spit them out. It's why worms spit them out. Crabs spit them out. They're just nasty. Um, they're also super weird and cool. So one of the things sea slugs can do, some sea slugs anyway, is when their bodies get kind of old and worn down and, and um, sick, their heads can pop off and crawl away and grow a whole new body that's healthy and fresh. And the old body just dies. And they're the most sophisticated animals that can do this, that can just grow a whole new body from a crawling head. Now that's gross, but also super cool. I mean, imagine being able to just grow a whole fresh new body if you wanted to. Um, and so there's a lot of interest by scientists to understand, well, how do they do that? Because maybe someday people will be able to grow new bodies if we can understand how the slugs are able to do it. I've seen crawling heads. I didn't know what was going on. I thought there'd been some horrible accident from the slug, but it turns out it's just a thing that happens in nature, who knew? Um, part of the research that I do is to discover and give names to new species. New meaning science hasn't recognized this species yet. Um, and so I was recently on a two week trip to an island called New Caledonia that is over by the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And for this trip, we worked with 25 local scuba divers um, some grandmothers, some parents, just local people that love the ocean and went out exploring with us and they collected specimens, including these sea slugs that are shown here um, to help us find new species that um, hadn't been documented before. Um, this is a sea slug I had never seen before. It's really beautiful. It kind of looks like an orchid um, or a Pokemon character. Um, but it's a sea slug. Uh, and we found a lot of species that don't have official science names yet because they haven't been recognized and given names, those two part scientific names that I've shown you before. And these, so these are two species that we found for the first time. I had never seen them. And I think that they are new to science. This is definitely a new species that doesn't have its name and it crawls in this really fun inchworm kind of seesaw style. Um, I've never seen another species that does quite this before, but it was really fun um, to watch this slug crawling around. It's like see-through and purple and green and has polka dots and all kinds of super cool things about this, um, this species. So uh, it's super fun to, discover something that you've never seen before and that maybe nobody has really seen before. At least none of the scientists that work on these animals have potentially ever seen this before. So to try to describe it for other scientists um, is a super fun part of the job that I get to do. And I get to give these species names sometimes. So like a couple of years ago, I didn't have, I didn't have anything to give two of my nephews for Christmas. So I, I gave each of them a sea slug species. I named two species after my nephews. So this is my nephew, Kyle. And so he has his own sea slug named after him. It's a species called Oxynoe kyli. And I found it on this trip in New Caledonia. The, the local divers found it actually. And they were like, oh, we're so excited. We found this species. We love this species. It's so hard to find. It's really cool. It's really beautiful. And they knew its name and I got to say, you know, it's named after my nephew, Kyle. Um, so that's one of the really fun parts of my job. I named a species after my grandmother. I've named species after my favorite character from television, after some personal heroes, after politicians who have 
done important work conserving the ocean and protecting it. Um, and uh, it's and, and I've named some species after indigenous people that are native to a particular area where a species is found. And, and it, it's just one of the fun perks of doing the kind of species discovery work that I do as a, as a marine biologist. And so the last thing I want to talk about is why I am excited to be working with people from the Falkland Islands. Um, I have for a long time been puzzled by two sea slugs that our research shows are closely related to each other. Part of what I do is to use information from things like DNA and the anatomy of species to figure out who is closely related to whom. So for example, you might have a group of students in a classroom and you could say, okay, well, here I have a brother and a sister and I have their cousin. And then I have some other students who are not in their family. How would you arrange those students so that you know, they're arranged by how related they are? Well, you would put the brother and sister together because they're the most closely related then their cousin would be the next most closely related. And then someone outside their family would be further removed because they're not in the same family. I do that with species. So I kind of group species into how closely related they are to each other. Um, and sometimes you get strange results. Like there is a species in New Zealand, which is over by Australia, and its closest relative that we know about is found in England, which is in the North Atlantic, on the opposite side of the planet. And two things that are each other's closest relative, they shouldn't really be as far apart as you can possibly get on the planet. There, there should be something in between. Like brothers and sisters usually live in the same house. They're, close relatives are usually found close together. And that's true for species also. Closely related species are usually found near each other on the planet. It's very weird when they're found on the opposite ends of the world. And this never really made any sense to me um, until some of my new friends from um, your part of the world sent me videos and photos of a sea slug that we think hasn't been seen for about 80 years. And it tentatively has a name. It was named after someone named Evelyn. So its name is Ercolania Evelinae. Um, and I think it probably is like the missing link between these other species. I think it's in their family and it's in the South Atlantic. So it's kind of in between the North Atlantic and the South Pacific. And so I think it's going to help unite these into one family together. I bet they also have a missing relative in South Africa that we just don't know about yet. Um, so I need to find some new friends who wanna go out and explore the tide pools in South Africa and find the, find the fourth relative in this little family um, to complete the puzzle and figure out um, who this little group of slugs is. And I think they need a new name. I think they need a name that reflects particularly the Southern Hemisphere group that's, that's unique and distinctive. Um, they shouldn't be in this group called Ercolania. That's not who they're related to. They're kind of their own special little group of sea slugs. And I hope that by studying the specimens from the Falkland Islands, um, I'll be able to give them their own name and separate them and tell other scientists about this species because no one really is aware of this species. Um, and no one recognizes that this little family of slugs is distinct and special um, and different from all the other slugs um, that it's currently lumped in with. So I want to say a special thanks to Nerissa Bax and Stephanie and Gabriel Carter who collected these slugs and took lots of amazing underwater video and photos for me and sent specimens to me. Um, I am very lucky in that a lot of people um, help me do the work that I do by making observations in nature, 
making collections, taking notes, photos, um, videos, and sharing their findings with me because it helps me understand better what's happening in the sea slugs uh, of the ocean all over the whole world. I can't go to everywhere in the world as much as I would like to, but um, with people sharing their findings and sharing their information with me, I can try to build up a better understanding of kind of how the sea slugs of the whole ocean, um, what they're doing, who they are, how they're related to each other, and I can share that information with other scientists. So thank you so much for listening. And um, hopefully you will remember that sea slugs are beautiful, fascinating, sometimes gross, but usually really super cool. And um, you will, you'll love them as much as I do. Thanks.